Hello, thank you for joining us today. It is such a joy to see all of your names popping up from all over. It really is a pleasure to welcome you as this is a real passion project for a lot of us. Hello, my name is Jacqueline Yao and I'm a Stanford alumna from the class of 1991. Today's event, 100 Years of Suffrage, The Work Continues, is brought to you by the Stanford Alumni Women's Impact Network and the Stanford Women's Club of San Francisco. The Stanford Alumni Women's Impact Network is a global club that connects social justice oriented Stanford alumni and students to shift dialogue and impact change. The Stanford Women's Club of San Francisco is one of the oldest Stanford alumni clubs and is celebrating its 100th anniversary. In today's program, we will learn about the history of the suffrage movement, what role Jane Stanford students and faculty played, where we are in the movement 100 years after the 19th Amendment was ratified, and how women can keep the fight for voting rights alive right now. Today's program feels especially relevant in light of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's passing. She was a champion for gender equality and carried on the fight for equal rights for women begun by suffragists. We are very fortunate to be joined today by three incredibly distinguished speakers. Amy Allison, the class of 91 from She the People, Jennifer Helton, class of 92, assistant professor of history at Ohlone College, and Lisa Garcia Bedoya, vice provost for graduate studies and dean of the graduate division for UC Berkeley. Thank you so much again for tuning in today. First, our panelists will each make a few introductory remarks, including what suffrage means to them. Then we will move to a Q&A format where I will ask our panelists some questions. Thank you to the very thoughtful questions that so many of you submitted while you registered. We'll be sprinkling those in along with your live questions throughout. And I apologize as we probably won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll make our best efforts to do so. So without further ado, let us begin with Jennifer Helton. Jennifer is an assistant professor of history at Ohlone College in Fremont, California. She has written extensively on the history of women's suffrage and women's rights, particularly in the 19th century American West. Jennifer's work has been published by High Country News, Wyophile, the National Park Service, and other outlets. Her essay on the history of suffrage in her home state of Wyoming appears in Equality at the Ballot Box, published by the South Dakota Historical Society Press in 2019. Jennifer graduated from Stanford in 1992 with a bachelor's degree in history with honors and classics and also a master's in humanities. So welcome, Jennifer. Please take it away. Hello, thank you so much, Jackie. Um, and it is such a huge honor to be here today to be on this panel with all of these remarkable and amazing women and to have the opportunity to honor the legacy of the women who got us the right to vote um, that we have today and that we need to continue to work to expand and preserve. Um, so I've been asked to talk a little bit today about um, the, the history of the suffrage movement and the role of Stanford in it. And I think as I'm doing that, what suffrage means to me will become um, apparent. Um, so I wanna start off with this image. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with these women. Um, this is, these are the silent sentinels, the women who protested silently um, in front of uh, the uh, White House for two years. Um, you can see that our university, Leland Stanford Junior University, was well represented at those protests. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the story of what happened to these women. That, that, that some of them during the course of the protesting were arrested, um, were, were sent to a prison in Virginia. They went on a hunger strike there, refused to eat, and were force fed. And um, the story of these women and their protest is very important in the suffrage movement, sort of public outrage against the treatment of these women did a lot to sort of shift public opinion in favor of suffrage. And this was certainly an important moment in the movement. But there is an older story that kind of goes back well before those protests and sort of from a political perspective probably has more to do with why suffrage passed. And this is an image also from 1917. Um, this is a flyer put out by the National American Women's Suffrage Association, which shows a sort of central fact of the 19th Amendment, which is that before the 19th Amendment, 
many American women already had the right to vote. So you can see that in Western states, um, women were fully enfranchised and in many Midwestern states, women had a uh, presidential franchise. And as this poster points out, um, these states together controlled 172 electoral votes. And so if you were in Congress or if you were a presidential candidate and you were looking at the electoral map in 1917, you could kind of see that women's suffrage on the federal level is inevitable. And so for me, what suffrage means to me is that grassroots organizing on issues at the local level can eventually, with patience, lead to federal change. And I think for me, that's the important um, me uh, lesson of the suffrage movement. Um, so the suffrage, uh, these, so what happened was that state campaigns were led by local grassroots organizations which led to the enfranchisement of women in the states, which then pushed for federal pressure to enfranchise women. And one of the questions I always get at talks like this is why was the West first um, to enfranchise its women in, at the state level? And the presence of coeducational institutions such as Stanford University are a big part of that. So you can see that this is a flyer for the meeting of the Stanford chapter of the Collegiate Woman Equal Suffrage League happening at Robley Hall. This was an organization that was started at Stanford in the early uh, 1900s. Um, and organizations of college women such as this were very important in uh, state level suffrage movements. College women um, had uh, often uh, graduated, they often became professionals, they had careers, they had money, they had networks, and they put all of those at the service of the suffrage movement. And so many important suffragists came out of Stanford, and there's many stories that I could tell you, but I'm going to tell you just a little bit about this woman, Anne Martin, who I think is very important in the suffrage movement, and I'm guessing most of you probably haven't heard of her. Um, she's pretty typical of suffragists of this generation. She was originally from Nevada. She, uh, her parents were immigrants. Her father was from Ireland and her mother was from Germany. Um, her father was a populist who had served in the Nevada State Senate. So she kind of came from a radical political background. She came to Stanford, majored in history, the Stanford History Department. Um, and after majoring in history, she worked for a while as the history professor and then traveled the world. In the process of doing that, she um, joined um, the British suffrage movement. She ended up in Britain and, and joined the suffrage movement there. And at one point while she was taking part in a protest movement there, she was actually arrested. And so she called up her um, college friend, Lou Henry Hoover, um, to come bail her out of jail. And Lou Henry Hoover couldn't come, but she sent her husband, future president Herbert Hoover, to bail her out. Um, by the time he got there, somebody else had already bailed her out. But you could see that from kind of that story that, that Stanford sort of at all levels is, is really in support of the suffrage movement. Um, after getting out of jail and coming back to the United States, Anne Martin then uh, went back to her home state of Nevada and she organized the successful suffrage campaign in Nevada that got women the right to vote in 1914. So you can see that um, Stanford and um, colleges in the West generally were important in sort of, you know, creating a generation of women who um, then organized for successful campaigns across various Western states. Most Stanford women of this era, Stanford was, um, you know, diverse in the sense that it allowed women to enter, but it was not diverse in other senses. Um, and many people, when they think of the, the women's suffrage movement, they think of it as very much a white middle class movement. Um, and that is not necessarily the case. Um, there were, uh, particularly here in the Bay Area and in California, in order to get suffrage passed, it was necessary to form a coalition which appealed to diverse constituencies of voters. And that meant outreach to uh, the many different communities that make up California. So this is a picture from an Oakland newspaper um, from the day, the first day in which women were eligible to vote after women won the right to vote in the successful California campaign. The two women here, Clara Elizabeth Chan Lee and Emma Tong Lung, are registering to vote. And the caption for this photo in the newspaper says that they were the first women in California to actually register to vote. Um, this photograph is of Tai Lung, who is a Chinese American woman from San Francisco, who was the first Chinese American in California to vote when women were able to do that in the first election of May of 1912. So there was a lot of suffrage activism and organizing in the Chinese American community in California. African American women were also very important in Bay Area organizing. This is Naomi Anderson, who um, had a national reputation as a suffrage speaker in the 1890s. Uh, she came to California and spoke in the 1896 campaign, sometimes sharing a platform with Susan B. Anthony as she spoke to many different audiences um, in the Bay Area. 
Uh, this is Sarah Overton, who organized, uh, was one of the organizers of the San Jose Political Equality League, was an important um, uh, 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 suffrage organization from the South Bay. And then this little clip gives us some information about the Colored American Equal Suffrage Association, which had several chapters that were uh, active in Oakland. This was led by Myra Virginia Simmons. Um, and they organized African American communities in many um, uh, communities in the East Bay. And actually, on, on, um, in the election of October 11th, when women got the right to vote, these women um, sent out patrols to the, vote, uh, to the voting uh, areas in the East Bay to make sure that there was no voter fraud, because there was a lot of concern that opponents of suffrage would actually stuff the ballot boxes. And so um, suffrage organizations, one of the things they did was patrol voting sites to make sure that that did not happen. Um, in Southern California, reaching out to the Latino community was extremely important. The president of the, col of the um, College Equal Suffrage League of Southern California was Maria de Lopez, um, and she spoke widely um, in both English and Spanish to promote suffrage and made sure that suffrage materials were distributed um, in English and Spanish, um, ensuring that outreach would occur to the diverse communities. And in California, as in many Western states, when suffrage passed, it passed by a very small margin. So this outreach um, was extremely important in making sure that suffrage came to California and the rest of the West. All right, so take it away, Jackie. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa Garcia Bedoya. She is the Vice Provost for Graduate Studies and Dean of the Graduate Division overseeing Berkeley's almost 12,000 graduate students. She is a Chief Advocate for Graduate Education and Research at Berkeley. Lisa's research focuses on understanding the causes and consequences of political inequities and inequalities in the U.S focusing on disparities that cut across the lines of ethnicity, race, gender, class, and more. Lisa is one of the nation's foremost experts on political engagement within communities of color. Thank you so much, Lisa, for joining us today. Please share your remarks. Thank you so much, Jackie. Thanks to all of you for being here um, and for inviting me to talk to you tonight. Um, so I think the most important thing to think about while it is absolutely true, and Jennifer did a lovely job of laying out um, how diverse the suffrage movement was in the United States, we have to remember that we have to think about which women, which women were the women that were able to vote um, once the 19th Amendment was ratified. And so this year we're celebrating 100 years of women's suffrage, but only 55 years of suffrage for women of color. Um, many of you may not know, or some of you may know, the Constitution gives states the right to determine voting rights. And so as um, the map that Jennifer put up makes clear, states had very different definitions of who could vote and who couldn't. Um, some states even had non-citizen voting rights during the 19th century. The 15th and 19th Amendments were supposed to make certain um, that, that enslaved, freed, former enslaved people would be able to vote. Um, but those rules were violated pretty regularly. Um, Native Americans um, were made citizens of the United States actually by force in 1924. Um, and so you see that on the slide. And they had to fight for the right to vote state by state. And so it wasn't until 1962 actually that every state um, gave Native people the right to vote. So obviously Native women didn't have the right to vote either. If we look at Asian American women, one of the first laws that were passed by the US Congress um, in 1790 after the Constitution was ratified was a naturalization law that made explicitly clear that you could not naturalize as a citizen in the United States if you were not white. And if you're interested in the trials and tribulations of different people, immigrants trying to be defined as white so that they could naturalize, Ian Haney Lopez has a great book called White by Law, which shows all of the weird contortions that the Supreme Court made in order to sustain that law. What this meant was that Asian immigrants couldn't naturalize. And so of course, Asian immigrant women were not able to vote. Uh, people of Chinese origin were allowed to naturalize in 1942. Women from other Asian countries had to wait until 1952 to be able to naturalize when the McCarran-Walter Act finally took the racial restrictions off of naturalization in the United States. Uh, fun fact for you women, in case you don't know, for much of US history, citizenship for women was actually derivative of a man, either your husband or your father. 
So that meant if you were a U.S. citizen and you chose to marry a man who was ineligible for citizenship, i.e. an Asian immigrant, you actually lost your citizenship as a woman. Um, so, and that was in place until, of course, the 20th century. Um, so the other thing that happened, so even though legally, technically, after the Civil War, um, Black women um, were able to vote, I mean, sorry, after suffrage, Black women were able to vote. But from a practical standpoint, because of Jim Crow laws, poll taxes, literacy tests, which it did not only exist in the South, they actually also existed in some Northern areas. And those laws were used to restrict the vote to Native peoples in those states where they were given the right to vote, and also people of Latin American origin. Um, specifically in Texas, you had not only the same voting restrictions of poll taxes and literacy tests, but you also had the lynching and other state violence that went hand in hand with the restrictions on political rights um, for African Americans in much of the United States during that period. So what this means is that the struggle for suffrage meant something very different in communities of color. Um, there were different motivations. White suffragists tend to frame, tended to frame the, their arguments around gender equality, whereas black suffragists were really thinking about community uplift and a broader um, incorporation of suffrage as part of a package of rights, including um, passing anti-lynching laws and, and getting rid of Jim Crow segregation. And so when the 19th Amendment passed uh, for BIPOC women, it meant that they had to continue the struggle at a time when these organizations were dismantling um, and they essentially had to keep the work going either by themselves or, or with co-ethnic men in their communities. I think it's also important to note that many of the organizations that advocated suffrage were not supportive of Black women's rights. One of the most famous conflicts is between Ida B. Wells, the very famous Black suffragist, and um, Frances Willard, who was president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, many people have never heard of this organization, but they were actually one of the most power social, powerful social organizations in the United States um, in the 19th and early 20th centuries. They're actually um, largely responsible for bringing us prohibition. Uh, and Ida B. Wells, in her autobiography, Crusade for Justice, said, quote, that Willard, quote, unhesitatingly slandered the entire Negro race in order to gain favor with those who are hanging, shooting, and burning Negroes alive. So not only was Willard not willing to support um, Ida B. Wells' work to pass anti-lynching laws in the United States, there was an explicit strategy that her organization followed, which was to try to uh, bring white men over to the cause of women's suffrage by basically saying that giving white women the white to vote was a lot safer than actually allowing black men to vote. So it was an explicit appeal to white women's um, superiority, essentially, to be part of the polity. Um, Willard also stated that, quote, the best people she knew in the South, unquote, had told her that Black people were threatening the safety of white women and children. She continued, quote, it is not fair that a plantation Negro who can neither read nor write should be entrusted with the ballot. And so I think it's important that we recognize that while the suffragists did incredible work and really pushed the ball forward in terms of giving women more of a voice in our politics. Um, the movement was also infused with the history of white supremacy that has long been part since the founding of our country and that it intersected in important ways with um, toxic masculinity and the ways in which gender and race intersected um, in terms of relationships between white women and the black community. And so that's why it's so important as we think about uh, women's voting and women's political engagement that we use an intersectional lens and always ask which women we're talking about. I'll end by saying what suffrage means to me. Um, I see suffrage as being a moment when women for the first time were able to have a say in our collective well-being and the ability to be recognized as our own people separate from our husbands and brothers and fathers and a member of the polity um, whose voice has value that what we said was meaningful. And I think we have still not fully arrived at a place where women are really able to have self-determination, all women right, of different backgrounds, and to be able to control their bodies and their politics and their opportunities in their lives. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, Jackie. Thank you so much, Lisa. Just really, really educational and inspirational.
It's now my pleasure to introduce Amy Allison. Amy is the founder and president of She the People, a national network elevating the voice and power of people, of women of color. She brings together voters, organizers, and elected leaders in a movement grounded in values of love, justice, belonging, and democracy. In 2018, Amy was one of the primary architects of the Year of Women of Color in Politics. In April of 2019, she convened the first presidential forum for women of color, reaching a quarter of the American population. She's a democratic innovator and visionary. Amy leads national efforts to build inclusive multiracial coalitions led by women of color. She leverages media, research, and analysis to increase voter engagement and advocate for racial, economic, and gender justice. She holds a BA and MA from Stanford. Welcome, Amy, back to the farm. Take thank you very much, Jackie, and um, thank you so much for uh, Lisa, you know, just really setting uh, the stage. I'm very happy to be here. Um, she the People as a national network focuses explicitly on women of color because we've got to think about what it was in August 100 years ago. There were 5.2 million black women, mostly from the former Confederacy, many of whom had been actively working um, to eliminate the barriers that black people faced, but also black women faced, had been working and organizing uh, for suffrage. Uh, had been uh, dismissed and um, turned away and ignored by most of the major national suffrage, uh, suffragette groups who, uh, in, in the, uh, as, as we've heard, in the name of uh, equality for white women, turned their back on black women. And yet, there wouldn't have been um, the, the victories that we have today our democracy, the franchise of democracy, would not have expanded had it not been for black women's fervent uh, and in, under very difficult circumstances uh, activism in an intersectional framework. So the movement that we're in um, owes a lot uh, to the suffragettes, suffragettes uh, from uh, the day. And it was always, as Lisa said, deeply uh, tied to uh, racism and white supremacy the way that Jim Crow practically uh, uh, prevented black women from um, exercising their full voting rights until 1965. The fact that uh, the movement for racial equality, which uh, was behind um, much of uh, the argument for black women's vote and women of color's vote, uh, 1920, 100 years ago, wasn't the end of anything. And in fact, when they were, when they were celebrating, here are the three white women and these are heroes, uh, black women did not have access until 1965 and were asking white women to come along and ensure racial equality, and that didn't happen. And so uh, the, the uh, movement uh, in order to continue fighting for voting rights is inextricably linked to the movement for racial equality. And so for us to understand what the 100 years are for us it, it, it is to know that. And um, I couldn't have said it uh, better um, than Lisa. So I'd like to talk about uh, what it means um, today because we heard a lot about history. Um, women of color are the fastest growing group of voters in this country. Right alongside 1965's Voting Rights Act, which guaranteed black people and black women access to the ballot box, um, came the, uh, the Immigration and Naturalization Act, which is simply uh, allowed uh, non-white uh, you know, immigration, open up the floodgates to, to non-white immigration, and also uh, guaranteed voting rights for people who are coming from Asia and um, Latin America and other parts of the world that were not Europe. And because both of those things had a very deep and lasting um, influence on how our population now in 2020 is majority of people of color here is Stan where Stanford is in California in seven states and soon the majority of the country will be people of color. And so when we look at the changes in demographics, it doesn't necessarily mean that our voting rights and citizen rights have kept pace with that. So um, when we look at an election that's just 41 um, days away, it's important to understand the suffragette movement in, in, in the context of what's, what's currently happening. Uh, 
women of color are the most likely to be targeted for voter suppression. You heard the list of all the things that prevented women of color from exercising their vote uh, based on Jim Crow laws. Well, now many of those practices and policies are encoded into state law and are either bureaucratically taking people off the voting ro voter rolls, um, collapsing uh, locations where people vote in communities of color, the majority of those are women, um, making uh, astronomical lines, making it very difficult for people uh, to vote to, uh, to vote by mail. We, we saw what's happening in the post office, um, routinely taking people off the voter rolls, having exact match, all of these uh, techniques to limit uh, uh, people from voting, which should not be political at all, affect women of color the most because of the communities that we are and because we constitute the majority of people of color who actually uh, turn out the vote. Um, it is also true that women of color have done, particularly you know, all women of color, but particularly black women from 1965 when we had regular access to the ballot box to 2020 are the highest vote turnout uh, vote group of anybody, any race, any gender. And I think 100 years shows that we didn't need 100 years to show how precious the vote is and we are the most civically engaged as black women. But if we look at uh, the fastest growing group, which is Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and La uh, um, Latinas and, and how critical the, the women's vote and the indigenous community are all together, uh, women of color are constitute 20% of the population. And in swing states, the same states that we see on November 3rd are gonna determine um, who gets a majority, who wins the Senate, and who's gonna take the White House. Uh, in many of those states, women of color are one in four voters. So the hard fought movement that uh, women of color had uh, led and had driven and did not benefit from 100 years ago, fought and continued um, until you know, some, you know, some 40 some years later, till now shows how precarious and how critical it is that we as a community continue to focus on making sure that everyone can vote. Everyone can vote. And looking at it from a gender justice and a, and a racial justice lens, also economic justice to make sure that people who, have, um, who work for hourly wages, who are low wage workers, also get time to be able to vote or can vote on a national holiday. There are so many structural ways that we as a movement can take um, uh, inspiration from the women of color who uh, stayed true to the, um, the, the tenet of, of democracy, uh, the true tenet, which is that we have one thing that we all can do to shape our government and shape democracy, and, and, and that's the vote. So, you know, uh, I was so glad to be part of this conversation because it isn't, it, I've had many years in my life, and I'm 50, like a lot of you who graduated in 91, that, that suffrage, suffrage, suffragettes were celebrated without a, a racial lens. We cannot afford to, to um, have an understanding or celebrate a holiday without asking that question, which women, without um, um, giving thanks and appreciation to the women who came before, and without rededicating ourselves to a view of voting rights under attack right now that includes uh, people of different races, genders, and economic uh, situations. And I think that's really what this means for me. Uh, I think this, this moment is a call to action. Um, I worked very hard on Stacey Abrams' 2018 gubernatorial campaign, and I saw firsthand a system in the state of Georgia that despite having a candidate that uh, 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 was able to increase the turnout of black voters, la uh, Latinx voters, Asian American voters, white voters uh, to historic levels in 2018, that's a midterm, midterm year, but, uh, but her campaign inspired huge numbers of people to go to the polls, a lot of young people and a lot of first time voters. In theory, that's what we want. We want a multiracial democracy where everyone feels engaged and gets out to vote. But I also saw uh, this travesty of justice with long lines 
and um, uh, people going, waiting in line and then going, hey, you're not on the voter rolls and you can't vote. And all, all the ways that students and college campuses were prevented from exercising their vote, um, all the way to not um, having accommodation for disabled or elderly people. It was a travesty and to see it up close uh, shaped me and helped me recommit along with Stacey Abrams and other people that voting rights, the most essential tenet of democracy has to be uh, defended. We need another um, and a new and refreshed multiracial movement in order to build a multiracial democracy. So uh, I wanna uh, send it back to you uh, with, my, with my thanks uh, for just including me in this conversation. Thank you so much, Amy. I'm, I'm powered up, I'm fired up, I'm ready to go. <laughs> Thank you all for such wonderful remarks and setting the stage for what's going to be a really incredible conversation. Fantastic. So now um, we're going to move into the Q&A portion of the program. But first, I want to remind all of our wonderful viewers and participants to add your questions in the Q&A box and upvote the ones you'd most like answered. Again, we will try to get to many, as many of them as we can. Um, thank you so much. So I'd like to start by asking all of the panelists um, you've already mentioned a lot of you sort of touched upon what suffrage means to you uh, and also what what's happened over the past hundred years. But I want to you to sort of think about what have we been doing right? Uh, what advances have been made? And Amy, you just touched upon what you think still needs to be achieved about this multiracial lens. Um, if you could talk more about that as well. Uh, let's start with uh, Jennifer, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, so one of the things I think a lot about, I spend a lot of my time reading documents written by these suffragists 100, 150 years ago. And as I'm reading these, one of the things that I always think about is how would they feel about what we're doing today? And um, I have to tell you, <laughs> I don't think they'd be too happy. Um, I think that they would expect that we would have made more progress than we have made. Um, you know, right now, less than 25% of Congress is female, okay, this last election, we just bumped it up a little bit there, um, but it's still, you know, pretty small, given that we've had the right to vote for 100 years. Um, as uh, Lisa and Amy pointed out, women of color, the representation is nowhere near, um, you know, proportional. So, I think that the suffragists themselves would want, would, you know, recognize the obstacles that are, um, continued to exist after the right to vote uh, was granted. And I think that they would encourage us to push harder, to push down the barriers that existed. Because suffrage was never just about voting. Um, these women knew that the vote was a means to power. Um, and I think that what has happened is that we've gotten the vote, but we have not yet gotten the power. Um, and we need to take the power and then, you know, make the things happen that we want to see happen in our society. If I can jump in, I do think it's important to remember that the 2016 election was decided by the folks who didn't vote. 48% of eligible Latinx voters didn't vote. And I don't say that as a way to sort of cast shame and blame on those voters. I actually think when people choose to sit out of the political process, it's a completely rational response to a lifetime of messages that you don't have power, your voice doesn't matter, and it's not gonna make a difference. And so the first thing we have to do is change that narrative and remember, you know, I, I study voting and almost always when I make presentations, people are like, Ugh, voting doesn't matter, why do you even study that? And all I would say is if voting didn't matter, the governments would not have spent so much time over the course of American history trying to keep people from being able to do it. And so it's really about reorienting and re-educating people and making people realize that this is one of the ways, I mean, there's protests, there's other kinds of movement activity as Amy so eloquently spoke about, um, where people can gather to get together collectively and solve the problems that really matter to them. And I think really changing that orientation and, and really thinking about how we can work together, how we can find common ground, and that our activity as, as citizens and as, as members of this community is, not just during elections, um, but that elections are just one way that we're able to um, determine what matters to us and what we think our elected officials should be using our collective resources on. And so if you can talk to, I know one of the questions in the chat was what's the one most impactful thing? You need to bring five of your friends to the polls and you need to tell them why um, and have them tell five of their friends why we need to take back our democracy. Yeah, and I would just, I'd build on Lisa's comments and go, okay, well, uh, if you look at 2016's congressional results, 
Um, you only can understand that in the context of the fact that women of color's turnout increased 37% over the last midterm, which was 2014. And um, higher turnout, particularly in these key districts that are turning to be, they're becoming majority people of color, but even not, and like a Lauren Underwood, who uh, is a congresswoman that was elected, a very young congresswoman, a registered nurse, who uh, was elected majority white district uh, north of Chicago. We are hearing um, um, and seeing a set of uh, women of color who uh, are able to be fueled by expanded turnout um, into, into office, not only um, in Congress, but down ballot. And the reason I mention that is because we, uh, we have a system, a political system, we know it was made for rich white dudes that were slave owners. I mean, very be the very beginning of the, the, the political system wasn't built for us. And what we see in the modern day political system is so many barriers and impediments for there to be uh, women and women of color in particular uh, to be elected. Uh, the gatekeepers and the fundraising, but also the beliefs about uh, who looks like a leader and who deserves leadership. It's one of the things, one of the reasons that our Achieve the People, our, one of our big goals uh, was to create enough public attention, the fact that we have an opportunity to inspire and to engage this critical part of the electorate that's typically sidelined or ignored by both parties um, uh, by having a woman of color at the top of the ticket. And we pushed from late February, but up until the moment where Kamala Harris uh, our center here in California was named as uh, Biden's running mate. I wasn't sure whether we were going to be able to break the barrier, despite the fact that as voters, we were so critical. Our presence in, in states uh, like Georgia and Arizona and Texas are going to, and our turnout is going to determine uh, the results of the election. And um, having representation all up and down the ballot is one of the ways that we can say, okay, uh, in the last 100 years, more things are possible. In the last two years, though, when you look at the AOCs or the Rashida Tlaib out of Michigan, or you look at Deb Holland, first indigenous woman um, out of New Mexico, why now? And the answer is higher turnout and women of color who are explicitly reaching out, uh, working with organizers, registering and engaging new voters. And if we have new and additional voters or uh, young women, uh, then, then we have different kind of leaders with different priorities. And that's the exciting possibility, despite uh, the fact that, um, there, that we hear from the White House a lot of questions about the integrity of elections and that kind of thing. Really, the action is, at, um, um, is uh, driven by organizers on the ground who are focused on making sure people vote and making sure those votes are counted. Thank you. That, that just sort of reminds me. Um, talking about sort of getting the vote out, how about talking about the most effective ways we can prevent voter suppression and election tampering, leading up to the election and beyond. So what steps, and a number of people wrote about, asked about this, what steps can we take individually? And perhaps this is good to start with, um, with you, Lisa, and then go to Amy, and then Jennifer, if you have something to add too. The organization that is uh, most effective at making sure at least on election day in, in polling places, um, the rules are followed as a lawyer's committee. So one easy thing you can do is, is, is give them a donation because they're always struggling and stretched. And I have a feeling this time they're going to be even more stretched than usual. Um, the problem is with voter, and, and so that's making sure that people, when they get to the polls, are able to vote. The challenge though in, in a vote by mail election is that the suppression becomes privatized. So it used to be that suppression is it happens in public space. Now it's going to happen in private space. Um, I think the more so, you know, making sure that your county registrars are, are mailing ballots, um, pushing them to put stamps on them so that they're easy to return, um, working to educate, you know, uh, the California Voter Foundation has really nice information on how, how to fill out your mail-in ballot. This is less voter suppression than because, you know, the signatures have to match. I don't know about you, I registered, you know, what feels like a million years ago. I don't write my name the way that I wrote it when I registered to vote. I don't even remember what, how I wrote it when I registered to vote. Um, so making sure that the registrars, you know, have the resources, one of the le least kind of sexy things to give money to is electoral administration. I mean, did you even know that your county re registrar does this? Usually they have a computer from 1984 in a back room and they're trying to figure this out. So I think paying more attention 
supporting our Secretary of State has been very active in trying to ensure um, that people have their voting rights, um, supporting the Vote Choice Act, making sure your county adopts it in California. That's a, a, a new set of rules that make registration easier, that make voting easier, that set up vote centers instead of polling places, make vote by mail simpler. Um, but I really think it's really about shifting our expectations and having collective responsibility to say everybody should have access to the ballot and it's our job to actually make it easy. Um, and any elected officials who are not doing that, we need to vote them out of office. And so, you know, I think it's hard as an individual in the context of this election and COVID and a pandemic to, to monitor, but I think um, in, the, in a broad sense, we need to have this conversation as a democracy about the fact that we should be making this easier, not harder, and we should be investing our state resources to make that happen. Well, I was just gonna say, you know, She the People partners with Michelle Obama's organization, When We All Vote. Here's three things that you can do they seem, seem simple, but sometimes it's the simple things. Uh, they call a vote tripling. I love Lisa added two more. So like get, get your immediate people uh, to vote. If you want to have super duper impact, then um, look at the, the map. You can get people in your own world, people that you text and they're, you know, that trust you and, and make sure that they have a plan and they have a plan to vote. Um, if you look at the map, the states that are going to determine the results of the White House and the Senate elections, you know, every, every state has very important, uh, we have very important um, statewide um, uh, initiatives, so it's important everyone votes anyway, even in California, but, you know, uh, look at who you know in Arizona, Texas, Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, Colorado, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. If you got people there, you got family there, really, really that those are the states um, that will determine electoral college votes and the results of the Senate election. So, um, so vote tripling or vote quadruple, quadruple, quintupling, quintupling um, uh, is the number one. The number two, if you have the time, volunteer to be a poll worker. You would not believe how this volunteer day, so many people there's a lot of, um, it's typically people who are north of 65 or 70 who, who volunteer, the retired age, who volunteer to be poll workers. But um, the challenges are so severe. There's a party, one of our political parties that has, is paying $20 million to poll watchers who, are, who have translated in the primaries to armed white people. You know, it, their poll watchers got to be on the P's and Q's. They got to look at the list. They got to make sure that everyone who's eligible to vote cast a ballot. And so, so if you have time, be a poll worker. Um, and, and the third uh, uh, is that you support organizations who are turning out votes. And um, Fair Fight is the Stacey Abrams organization that's in 20 states. Uh, Lisa's organization, amazing, because they're going to do, they're doing a lot of the fights to make sure people have the right to vote. And then I'm going to just share, <laughs> I don't want to give too much information, boom, but like, the, the women of color led on the ground organizations who are, are registering and turning out voters this year need our financial support and volunteer uh, power. One Arizona, uh, Texas organizing project, the Florida New Majority and um, uh, Georgia New, New Georgia project. And all of these are amazing organizations that um, have our trusted voices and have a great infrastructure. It, they're the ones who are the front lines of the fight to make sure that everyone's registered because we have we have a, uh, about a week and a half left of the registration deadlines and then making sure people actually uh, turn in their ballots and, and, uh, and vote. It's interesting, uh, besides getting everyone to vote and tripling and quadrupling the effect, a number of questions have actually come up about our young people. So how do we get our young people to vote? I, I had heard someone suggest having a great sports figures as poll workers and they would definitely flock to the polls. So do you have other ideas of how to motivate young people? This one person said, I'm a white woman high school teacher who truly wants to help my students learn to protect their rights to vote in the future. How can she participate in this conversation and how do we get young voters to vote? So as a teacher, I think what you can do, so young voters are just like other voters. They have to believe it matters, right? And the reality is our, our elected officials very rarely talk about policy in, in ways that are meaningful to young people. So that's problem number one, is no one's talking to them. As a teacher, 
Um, what we've learned, we need a different kind of civics education. So a, a problem focused civics education. So instead of saying, you know, the founders are brilliant, the institutions are perfect, don't worry your pretty little head, which is essentially what we're taught in school. Ask your students to come up with something that they really care about and then use that problem and through that problem figure out well who's responsible for solving that problem. What level of government does it sit in? Does it sit in multiple levels and to explain the federal system? How would you go about influencing those per people? Who are the folks that you would need to talk to in order to actually fix it? And they may come up with a problem in your school or a problem in your city or they may come up with climate change. But the point is that's a way in so that people understand the government is meant to serve them and that they're meant to access it and not this thing that you have to know all the right answers to who your congressperson is in order to engage in it. And so activating young people is really about giving them an on-ramp and letting them see themselves in the system. And the last thing I learned in my research, and this may be, seem silly, but the last thing an 18 year old wants is to feel dumb. And so one of the counties in California that has the highest rates of youth voting, one of the things the registrar does is they just go to the school and show them the machine and say, this is how you do it. Right? And especially for folks who don't have voting parents, this is especially important. So since we're vote, all voting by mail this year, bring a ballot and, and explain to your students how they fill it out and, and, and what to do. Explain to them they don't have to vote on all the down ballot races, or even if they want to vote on the down ballot races, how they find the information. We never teach people the nuts and bolts of the process, and that's a big part of why young people sit out. So if, if they know it's gonna matter to the things they care about, and they feel confident about their ability to engage, um, they will do so and particularly if they, they talk about it with other young people. So as a teacher, you are very, um, you're in a position to really make a huge difference in terms of letting, making them think about voting differently. Really good point. Um, thank you. Jennifer, did you have something to add? I saw that you just posted something. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to the last question to kind of put on my League of Women Voters hat for a moment and say, check out the League of Women Voters. Um, I, uh, websites, I also teach young people and, I think it's also important to sort of make sure that young people have resources, um, you know, especially here in California, we have so many things that we vote on and it can be an overwhelming amount of information. So again, from a teaching perspective, um, make that a group project in a class, right? You know, there's 8 million ballot initiatives um, around different issues you know, devote a month to it. You know, it's, it's a great way to spend time, to build community and to show people the different ways in which government um, impacts their lives. I think we're living in a historical moment where we've had um, a lot of disillusion for, with government for a very long time. And that is an explicit part of the political platform of one of our political parties is that, you know, government is bad for you. Um, and so I think that level of disillusionment that young people have around government is, is to me pretty dangerous um, and is something that I think, um, you know, we have to think about ways in which we can inspire young people to see how the system impacts them and how they can in turn impact the system. And by the way, we're all kind of old on this. So I want you to know that we are in good hands with Gen Z. Just think about the protests. They were multiracial led by 16, 17, eight year, 18 year old protesters demanding racial justice. Um, I think we need to turn uh, to organizers and leaders amongst the generation to elevate and to plug into their efforts. Uh, the Sunrise Movement on Climate Justice is a powerful youth-driven uh, effort, and they are spending um, on digital engagement, I don't know how many millions, reaching young voters. The other is um, Movement for Black Lives has uh, uh, not only a platform, but some of the local chapters are doing work in turning protesters into voters. Um, when I think about who I turn to, who I follow, because I'm a bridge person, I want my expertise to come from the impacted communities. If I want to find out um, what would increase uh, participation, I ask somebody who's 18 right now. Um, and uh, for me, it's this woman, Catherine Quinton, who's in Florida. She's part of a students, uh, students Learn, Students Vote Coalition. These are college age students who are organizing uh, to make sure that high vote turnout. And the real problem that we're having right now is, that I'm hearing uh, from our network, our national network, is college students, most of them aren't on campus, they're at home, they might be registered in the city where they go to school or they might be registered at home. And um, in that confusion, we just have to make sure that um, 
there's a plan to vote. So we have tools on the shethepeople.org site for young people to check their registration status and register before the deadlines are up that you can help uh, people connect people to, to those. But I follow the lead uh, of this generation who's going to show us how to get it done, I think. Hey, Amy, can you, uh, that's great. Can you repeat those organizations in those swing states once again? Um, yes, there are a lot more, let me just say, but here's the ones I really love and adore and they, they, you, could, you could make a donation or they also take out of state volunteers. One Arizona, uh, Texas Organizing Project, Florida New Majority, and the New Georgia Project. They're C3, C4, so they both register voters and turn out voters and they are all led by women of color and they are all extremely effective and need more resources in these last 40 days. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna pivot to, back to Lisa. I wanted to ask you more about, um, you're talking about people of color, uh, women of color. What are the best practices for engaging, mobilizing voters in low income communities of color? I mean, knowing that you've done so much work um, with big data. So I'm really interested in how you leverage that big data to drive this work that you do. These are the folks I want to build on something Amy said, because I think it's really important. Since we've moved to these large scale data vendors, um, they make propensity scores. They give propensity scores. So all of you on this call, if you're registered to vote, Catalyst, um, which is the one of the big vendors, has a score for what the, what the likelihood is that you're going to vote in this election between zero and 100. Most campaigns, because they have limited resources, only focus on people with scores above 70 or above. And so if you're a new voter, if you're a young voter, um, or if you're an infrequent voter, chances are you're just never going to get called by that campaign because they've decided that you're not worth their time, essentially. They don't, they don't know. They think it's going to take too many resources to turn you out. So it's really important, first of all, to know that if you talk to low propensity voters about things that they care about, so the first thing is it has to be someone to talk to them that's from their community, someone who's similarly situated. It has to be grounded in the things that they really care about. And so you need to start with what the Topos Partnership calls radical listening, right? You can't start asking someone to vote. I say it's analogous to asking somebody to marry you before you date it, right? People are not there. You have to get them there and you have to give them a reason to get there. And so it's really about asking folks, what are the things you care about? What are the things that matter to you? What do you care, what, what, what's going on in your family? And then talking through how voting or how this particular election or how this particular ballot initiative really will affect the things that they care about. And so it's about building relationships um, and it's about building trust because Jennifer's point about distrust is huge. And um, people have way too much information right now and they don't know what information they can trust. This was even before Trump and the Russians and the bots. And so developing a relationship and knowing that you have somebody who's like you, that you can believe what they're telling you is really important. And so the problem, the reason um, we created Data for Social Good was because if you believe that the way to a different electorate is through relationships and through activating people's networks, so to Amy's point, right, this idea that you tell two friends and they tell two friends that that's really what matters, our data systems didn't map onto that. And so we're creating a data system that's longitudinal where um, you actually have network information so you can identify influencers and who are the people who really you need to be talking to to talk to their friends. And to be able to build on that and to know, oh, you know what, we've been talking to you for the last two years. And the problem is the systems we have right now are designed for one shot campaigns that focus on likely voters. And what that means is, is that most folks of color just never get called by a campaign. Um, and I did back of the envelope analysis for this election for Latinx voters. If you add together the unregistered plus the low propensity, it means roughly 75% of eligible Latinos are never going to be on a campaign radar. And so what works is just talking to people. And I appreciate that in this moment, this is really challenging. And so it's creating that interaction, getting into people's networks and talking about the things they care about. Um, it's, it's not rocket science. I wanted to pivot for a moment, going back to the suffragists. And uh, we've talked about communities of color, but I also don't want to forget about the role queer women played in the suffrage movement. And I'd love to ask Jennifer to talk more about this, because I understand that the idea of voting advice was very much tied to the freedom to choose whom and how they loved. Could you comment about that community and other communities? Yeah, absolutely. So a huge portion of the leadership um, of the suffrage movement um, was composed of queer women. 
um, and, uh, you know, from sort of Susan B. Anthony on downwards. So there were a lot of queer women in the movement. Um, and the thing is, is that we know this because now 100 years later, we have access to people's private correspondence. And so we can see that, you know, in their personal lives, um, you know, women are, you know, forming strong relationships with other women, like living with them for many, many years. Um, and, you know, and, and living according to what today we might call um, lesbian relationships or, um, you know, along a whole range of the gender spectrum. But um, in the 20th, in the early 19th and late 20th century, one of the arguments that was most commonly used against the suffrage movement at that time was, is she a manly man or is she a womanly woman? Is she a manly woman or is she a womanly woman? And so these suffragists um, very closely guarded their queer identities, knowing that it would be damaging to the movement um, because the argument against suffrage was that voting was unnatural. And so if it was known that many of these women were queer women, then that would have, in the eyes of, of people of the time, confirmed that. And so, you know, and you, you don't see this just sort of in the women's rights movement, you see this in, in the civil rights movement as well, right? People who are activists having to hide um, their LGBTQIA identity. Um, at the same time, I think it's also clear that that is one aspect of their identity that drew a lot of these women to the suffrage movement um, because they're living lives that don't fit into the sort of gender norms of the time that makes them more aware of the need for change in society um, and, and for women to pursue their ability to, to make their own individual choices and to live as you know, free people. I wanted to ask Amy, a number of people have asked, how can we help more women run for public office? And how important is it to take part in local and state decisions? I'll take the second one first, because it's such a good question. Most eyes are focused on the White House and the Senate, and they, they should be, because those are consequential. But um, the, uh, if, you, if you think about the policy, and political responses to the protests that happened uh, during the summer. Those are local fights. Those are happening in state legislatures. These are happening um, for DA races. These are happening in city council school boards. And also there's an historic number of women of color who are running for office in 2020 down ballot, um, as well as for, for, for Senate. So um, uh, it's incredibly important. And we often look at building a pipeline is starting in the city councils and the state legislatures that go on to these federal offices. So it's uh, very important. I want to uplift the organizations who, uh, who are training and making sure that we have a pipeline of prepared women, and I focus on women of color in particular because we're so underrepresented at every level of government, um, and who are uh, doing the work, building, us, building up a cadre of people who, have the, the, who, who understand what it takes who uh, learn how to fundraise and know how to be a candidate and then govern. So um, some of the top organizations, um, uh, New American Leaders trains immigrants uh, for public office and they have special programming for women in, um, who are immigrants themselves or children of immigrants. And I love this organization, fantastic. Um, Higher Heights focuses on training black women to run for office as does Collective PAC. Collective PAC. And both are um, led or have um, senior leadership of, of women, black women. Um, and then uh, Emerge America is a co is kind of a collection of state-based training programs. Um, the, the president of Emerge is a black woman, Ashanti Golar, and several of the state-based, like Colorado, New Mexico, are those Emerge state programs that train are led by women of color and who um, have been able to tap into and train a cadre of women of color. So like, for example, uh, the, the congressional delegation in New Mexico for the first time is gonna be women, all women, uh, women of color. It's remarkable. The, the majority of the legislators in Colorado State House, because of the work of Emerge and, and the infrastructure built there, is a lot of women of color, particularly Latinas who are in senior leadership and in governance in the state house. So it has a real and practical um, impact on our representation. Um, I want to just say a shout out to going further upstream. We have to continue to, like the, the reason Lisa's presence here is so critical is because we have to have the data and the research um, 
uh, about uh, women, about women of color, in order to understand um, the electorate. And we have to create space in our culture, not just our political culture, in our culture, for the leadership, um, the, the vision, um, the values uh, that women of color are, uh, are providing. And that's around narrative and storytelling, which is what She the People does. So I think, I think, uh, I think it's an, an ecosystem. And I, and I uh, wanna move to a place someday soon where women of color are not the group of people in this country who are most likely to be defeated in the primaries. Because when we looked at all the women of color who are on the ballot, down ballot, she the people's keeping a track of that, you know, vast majority of them uh, lost in the, in the primaries. And what we're seeing now is people on the ballot in um, November, if they're in a competitive situation, um, they only got there it's hard for only a small percentage of people get there because of the structural problems within parties and amongst donors. So it's a whole bunch of things that need to, to change, um, but I think it's worth it looking at and supporting the organizations dedicated uh, to making sure that women and women of color specifically are, have all the tools that they need in order to successfully govern. So can I follow up that with asking, um, what do you think are the, th are the most challenging issues for women entering politics today? That was actually what I was going to, to build on Amy's point. We have to remember, if you're a relatively, if you're not rich and you've got kids, right, and you want to run for office, you're working for a year before that primary, right? You've got to meet with all the people. You've got to get all the endorsements. You have to start raising money. Who's going to watch your kids, right? Who's going to pay your salary during that year? And so that's um, the head of New, New American Leaders talks about this a lot, that we need to think about fundraising before people run. You need to have a pot of money to be able to run if we want people to be able to run who aren't already independently wealthy, right? And that's completely separate from then the party infrastructure and exactly all the things Amy was talking about, about who's taken seriously as a candidate, who's seen as being worth party investment, um, so it's a double difficulty in the sense that it's really difficult to have the time, space, and energy as a, as a woman, um, period, but especially a woman of color, to be able to take on any run for public office. I would just like to just kind of go backwards to the suffrage movement a little bit. And some of their, they were brilliant organizers. And um, some of the things that they did focused a lot around people having fun. So they had dances. They fed people. Um, in downtown San Francisco, there was a suffrage restaurant where working women could go have lunch and get some suffrage literature. And um, they, they could develop a sense of identity and community as part of their political activism. And I think that that's really important, too. If you want to engage people, um, you know, it, it has to be a part of people's lives that they can connect to and relate to and feel as part of a community that's doing good things and is moving the world forward. And so I just want to give a shout out to fun, you know, maybe bring back the dances and the food and the donuts because those things actually worked very well. Uh, I actually wanted to ask a clarification point that maybe you or Lisa could clarify. I'll ask you first, but um, one audience member asked, when did unmarried women unmarried Chinese uh, woman immigrant during the time of the Exclusion Act gained the right to vote? So immigrant women could not vote um, if you were Chinese until I think it's 1942. Um, as China and the U.S. ally during World War II, that's when the Exclusion Act is repealed. And so after that, immigrant Chinese women um, got the right to vote at that time. Um, other Asian women not until 1952 with the passage of the McCarran-Walter Act, I believe small friendly then the only thing can naturalize right and naturalization yes. takes yes. resources and documentation and not all of them were able to naturalize absolutely yes. absolutely very true and then in in uh, many chinese american communities after world war ii there's been a red scare that happens in those chinese american communities which makes the possibility of citizenship more remote as a lot of folks want to you know sort of stay out of the public limelight Thank you. I'm going to stay on you, Jennifer, and ask you to comment on, you know, we've been talking about the movement together, but there was also a number of um, anti-suffragists during the time of the suffragist, um, suffragist movement or suffrage movement. Can you please comment on this, this opposition? Why did so many Americans, including women, oppose it? 
Well, I am glad you asked me this because this is my chance to talk about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> um, so I have a, so one of the things that, so, so there's kind of two parts to that question. One is sort of um, people opposed suffrage for reasons having to do with their ideas about what appropriate roles for women were on the one hand, and then secondly, political reasons. So first I want, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about sort of the social ideas. So I'm gonna quote from a Supreme Court decision, um, the Myra Bradwell case from 1873. Um, and this was the first of several cases that the Supreme Court, or one of uh, several cases that the Supreme Court passed that basically said the 14th Amendment doesn't apply to women. Um, and here's what it says. Here's a couple quotes from that decision. The paramount destiny and mission of women are to fulfill the noble and benign offices of wife and mother. This is the law of the creator. And here's another quote from the decision that the natural and proper timidity and delicacy which belongs to the female sex evidently unfits it for many of the occupations of civil life. So many anti-suffrage arguments were similar to that. They're based on nature, they're based on religion, women aren't tough enough to handle civic life, God doesn't want them to be part of civic life. Um, it's just against the natural order of things. And because of that, the 14th Amendment doesn't apply to women. So that is what Ruth Bader Ginsburg took care of for us. So in those cases that she won in front of the Supreme Court in the 60s and 70s, she got the court to rule that in fact the 14th Amendment does apply to women and that is why gender discrimination um, then becomes illegal in the United States. It's, that's why the Supreme Court strikes down all those laws that say you can have one body of law for women and another body of men. So that is, we owe her that. Um, the second reason people um, oppose suffrage has to do with political considerations. So in the American West, this is often, as some folks have already mentioned, having to do with temperance. The biggest funded efforts against women's suffrage campaigns in the West come from the liquor lobby because they're afraid that if women get the vote, they'll vote in prohibition and you know kill their businesses. Um, so in the West, it's that. Um, in Congress, um, it is Southern congressmen from uh, white supremacist oriented states. Okay, so when you read congressional debates about, hey, why can't we have a federal amendment? Because you have to remember from the 1860s forward, there is always a women's suffrage committee in Congress and they're constantly considering the passage of a federal amendment. And it is always blocked by the South. Um, and the argument is always very vociferously because we don't want to expand voting rights because we in the South are engaged in suppressing voting rights. Um, and so there's a very solid block of opposition that there's not enough coalitions in the North and the West to defeat until we get to those electoral vote maps that I showed you um, at the beginning of the presentation. Jennifer, all that is amazing and absolutely right. I just wanted a, a, a little bit of historical context to understand at the turn of the 19th century, um, voting was about race and property. And what happens when Andrew Jackson loses the presidency is he and Martin Van Buren decide that they need to make a mass party. And that's when you see the expansion of suffrage to unpropertied white men, but gender gets added for the first time. And so it is true that free blacks did have some, you know, very few, right, who had property did actually have voting rights in the previous, you know, in the 18th century, early 19th century. In the 1820s, that all shifts. And so you start getting these definitions that voting becomes gendered. It's about the back room and the smoke and kind of, you know, fighting. And then women, their job was what was called the Republican motherhood, right? Their job was to raise good male voters. And that was, that, those are the arguments that Jennifer's referencing. You just say that that was a historical shift for political reasons to create a coalition of the Democratic Party that included immigrants in the North and slaveholders in the South. And so thank you, Andrew Jackson, that was him. Jennifer, there's an audience member who wanted a clarification note here. Can you clarify the comment that during suffrage, it was seen as safer for women to vote than, than allowing black men to vote? So this, from the very beginning of the suffrage movement, um, one of the arguments that some white suffragists made was that, okay, go ahead and let's have women's suffrage because there are more white women then there are black people total. And so if you allow um, white women to vote, they will outnumber the black population. And so 
this was an argument that was used by many in the national movement to appeal to Southerners to attempt to get them to um, uh, endorse suffrage. Um, as it happened in the Jim Crow South, they didn't buy that argument because they were so intent on restricting um, the right to vote that they were not willing to open it up in sort of any way. But it was an argument that you commonly heard from um, suffragists, both nationally and locally. Thank you. Well, we only kind of time is going by fast, so we only have time for a few more questions. But I do want to just sort of get a little more personal. I always like to know a little bit more about each of you. So what motivates you to do this work? Um, what led you to this point? I suppose my politics was formed as a 17 year old as a just a combat medic in the military. You know, I, I went to a play into an institution that didn't have very many women that um, in my experience, uh, I saw lots and lots of sexism and racism expressed in our training and the in environment and the way that we were communicated with and expectations, you know, um, and I didn't feel I had a voice. And when you're in the military, everything is based on, um, you know, rank. And when you're an E1 and you're at the lowest person, <laughs> you don't have any voice. I think for me, um, that was a really seminal experience to, um, for me to dedicate myself time and time again to express my personal truth and to find ways um, to organize and connect with people, particularly people who are different from myself. Like I, I uh, from a very early age from being biracial to having a, a rich community, very, very diverse multiracial community now where we organize in common cause for justice. I think that that's the, uh, the beautiful potential that I'm investing my life and my work in. And for like, I love um, helping women uh, to speak their truth. I love elevating uh, courageous moral exemplars among us. I love my, in my own self, it's an expression of my commitment to public service, but also helping those who want to help our country. They want to serve our country. And I think, I think really that's, that's been what shaped me and drives me even now. So my parents are, are refugees from Cuba. And, uh, you know, for many months, my parents had no country. They had to go through Jamaica. This was before um, the Cuban Adjustment Act and, and, you know, in early 1961. And I know that politics is the reason that I'm here, but I also really appreciate and I'm, um, the opportunity I was given. Had my parents stayed in Cuba, I would never have gone to UC Berkeley. I would never have a PhD. I would never have had this chance to really stand on the shoulders of giants and do my best um, to leave the world a little bit better than I came into it. And especially I understand because of their experience, the fragility of democracy and the importance of government to protect the weak. You know, I grew up with Jose Martí, right? A social Democrat, the idea that, that, the, that the state should protect its most vulnerable people and that those are the folks we should judge its worth from. And so I feel very privileged to use the skills that I've, that I've learned as a social scientist to try to help communities um, get the voice that Amy's talking about and to help themselves, right, to do the things that matter to them and to be able to um, realize what our, democracy, what our democracy is supposed to have been, but that we've never, never necessarily gotten to. And so um, the last thing I would say is that's one of the reasons why I, I enjoy teaching so much is that if I can get my students to just think about the world a little bit differently and really to see their own power within it. Um, that's just an incredible gift to be able to be able to do that um, for my life and get paid for it. It's kind of amazing. So I'm very grateful um, that I have the ability and the opportunity to do this work. For me, writing about women's suffrage comes from um, I'm from Wyoming. I'm I'm a I'm the I'm a first generation college student. I'm the first person in my family to go to college. And when I was growing up in Wyoming, we had one paragraph in a history book that talked about the fact that Wyoming was the first place to give women the right to vote. And then that was it. It was never mentioned again. 
And then I came to Stanford um, and took a lot of history classes and again, never mentioned, took a lot of history classes about the history of the American West. And the fact that the West was the first region to give women the right to vote was again, never mentioned. Um, and it's kind of the, and, and even reading, taking classes about feminism and reading about feminism, um, you know, again, never mentioned. Um, and so it seemed to me that from a lot of perspectives, a lot of the history that we get is not accurate. Um, and so we are, I think, going around with a lot of narratives in our head that are not necessarily accurate and true. And I don't think that serves us well. I don't think it, it is good for us to think that history is, you know, these five important people who do five important things and then everybody else is just kind of sitting around waiting to have things done to them. That's not how history happens. That's not how social change happens. Um, it happens from the ground up. Um, the suffrage movement was very much about people having conversations with the people in their lives and changing their minds about the possibilities of what the world could look like. And, and that's how change actually happens. And women have always been a part of everything that has happened in this country. Um, it's never been the rugged white male striding by himself across history, making everything happen. That's never been the case. Um, and we're not served well by believing that it was. It doesn't, it doesn't do good things for our sense of ourselves. It doesn't do good things for our young people thinking that history is not about them. One other question is, how can we get more men to care about suffrage and also show up for the fight? So this is obviously a fight than just for us. Um, Amy, can I have you comment on that? I, there, you know, uh, in the course of my work, um, building She the People and this new story about women of color, there have been many men who've contributed, particularly men of color, who are feminists and want to see a democracy uh, and a country and communities that are fully served with and have the leadership of women, women of color. And um, I wouldn't have been able to do it without that kind of allyship. I, I have the same philosophy. I find the men who are willing to put the resources and the work to support the movement, elevating their voice as a bridge to other men is a very, very powerful way to think about organizing. And so, um, uh, like, the whole reason for my work is not just for women of color. It's to build a multiracial democracy. It's to realize a politics we've, we have yet to see. And um, that, and to build coalitions and com where we have a heart for and love for our, our own communities and also others. Um, and that includes all genders, um, including transgender folks. And so, including people... Um, uh, including men in the movement, making a space for it, I think is the whole purpose. Um, and getting um, those who are with us uh, to help us to bring more men along, I think is, is, is the work uh, ahead of us. And unfortunately, we only have time probably for one more question and then some closing thoughts uh, for each of you. So uh, I'd like to ask each of you to name, I don't know, Three things, something that people can do right now um, to improve our suffrage or to, or to advance the movement. And closing thoughts, anything that you feel that you wanted to get to that we didn't get a chance to address. And I think we'll start with Lisa this time. I think we have to believe in our own power more. I think we have to appreciate that this is, um, repeating what Jennifer already said, but lifting it up and amen to everything Amy just said, um, that we're in a historic moment. Um, and, you know, as someone who studied Latin America, I can say democratic institutions are incredibly fragile and based on norms, I think we're learning more than rules. And once you lose faith in them, we've lost. So um, anytime someone says mail-in voting is, is, you know, can be rigged or is unsafe or, you know, I think we have to believe in the sanctity of the ballot. I think we have to believe in our institutions and I think we have to talk to everyone we know about why it is that in this moment we have to stand, this shouldn't be partisan, it shouldn't be political, we have to stand up for the right to vote, but also building on Amy's point for us to build the democracy that we, that we want to see, right? To build what it can be and to not let sort of cynical um, people interested in minority rule and power 
um, to take it away from us. And so I would say we all just need to really just stand up in this moment and, and appreciate that it's, it's on us um, to make sure that that doesn't happen. How about Jennifer? Can you go next, please? Um, yeah, I think, you know, as a, as a historian of, of women's movements, I think one of the things we really need to think about is how we can build women's movements um, I think in the last generation or so, um, I think we always need to be mindful of, of that divide and conquer is the best way to defeat any movement. So formatting divisions between different communities and different groups of people around specific issues, um, you know, um, is a way to weaken a community, right? So I think one of the things to think about is sort of moving forward, what are the dividing lines between American women and the way they vote? And I think at some point we have to have the conversation about um, you know, pro-choice, pro-life. And what are the ways that we can move beyond those divisions and build um, another movement that can um, push us forward um, in a way that, as Amy says, creates a multiracial, multiracial democracy in which we have a sense of community um, that is shared and then is also respectful of individual points of view and individual communities. Um, as she says, I think so eloquently, we've never had that. Um, and, and that's a new vision of what we as a country can be. Um, so I think we have to picture, like just, you know, write down what you think that would look like and let's figure out how to get there because women's suffrage took a hundred years. So this is gonna be, this is gonna be a long haul, but I think it's helpful to think about what we want that world to look like. I just want to um, just express my gratitude to you, Jackie, and to the organizer, April, and uh, just gratitude for being part of this community. Um, Stanford was the place where I cut my teeth on political organizing back when I was at, on the COP and working in the Senate and working in multiracial, you know, with, uh, with the Black Student Union and the, I mean, all the, all the ways that we uh, practiced doing the thing that is so critical to the country now. And uh, I have such gratitude for Stanford and for this community. So I thank you. And um, uh, uh, Lisa mentioned faith, faith in uh, ourselves, faith in the democracy, and faith in the vision, upholding the vision. And, um, and it takes great uh, courage right now um, for us uh, just to exercise, have a plan to safely vote and exercise our fundamental rights uh, as citizens, and that's the right to vote. And I would just leave it with, you know, um, politics was also often framed, and I, I can't remember who, what brilliant mind here said this, but it's often framed as war. And what I want to um, think about is um, shared values, the common ground. This is an opportunity for us to express it, the work I do has always been in the service of love and justice and creating a country where everyone belongs and that the democracy lives up to its highest potential. I believe that I have a faith and I invite you um, in all the ways and all the people that you know and all the ways that you can communicate that to not allow people to lose their faith in this, in the dark hours right before uh, this critical election. Thank you so much, Amy. I just have to say that this has been such a pleasure for me. I have to admit there's so much I didn't know about the suffrage movement. I didn't even know that the ERA, that we needed 38 states to ratify and that in January that we did, but it might not be illegal. So there's so many things I learned. And then uh, I just feel really, really grateful, like you said, Amy, to be part of this community. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa, Amy, and Jennifer. You were superb and brought so much um, inspiration and information to today. Uh, so thank you again. We really appreciate your insights and the gift of your time, and we appreciate the important work you do. So thank you so much. Um, and now to wrap up the session, thank you to our organizers, the Stanford Alumni Women's Impact Network and the Stanford Women's Club of San Francisco for putting together this timely and important event. Congratulations, San Francisco Women's Club again on your 100th anniversary. For more information about these two clubs, please go to their website, which is shown on the slide. And thank you for joining us today and spending your time with us. We sincerely appreciate your interest. Please vote and have a great evening. Thank you so much. <laughs>